Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here on a Saturday. Huh? Saturday. No, Wednesday. <laughs> well, every day you want. That's Sharon Moriwaki. She's the co-chair of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. And guess what? She's the co-host of Hawaii, the state of clean energy, which does broadcast at 4 p.m. on Wednesdays. We're making a special show today because we have a special guest. Guest. A special guest is uh, Gavin uh, Bade. And he is the editor, that means the senior editor, the most important editor, the guy at Utility Dive, which is an app and a newsletter about utilities and energy and environment all mixed up together uh, out of what? Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. Wow. Yeah. And now, I've, now I've told the essence about Gavin, but, but Sharon is going to actually introduce him. <laughs> well, I'm so pleased to have Gavin here. I'm pleased to be here. Uh, we, we um, you know, at Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, are just coming out of our annual legislative briefing, and we needed to know for Hawaii what is happening in Washington. It's so unpredictable, and we're so pleased that we have Gavin. Um, Gavin is, as, as Jay said, the uh, editor of Utility Dive. It's, it's not only an app, it's that keeps the thump of the nation, all the states, and we thought that it was really important for us to hear that as we go forward with this legislative session. And that's why the name that's of this why. episode is the same as the name of Gavin's speech, his presentation as keynote on Thursday. And it is, what, climate action in the age of Trump. Nothing political about that, okay? And Hawaii's role in the clean energy revolution. There's a lot of assumptions and provocations in there. Yeah, how, what, what does it do for our 100% renewables goal mm -hmm. yeah. in this age We need of to stay Trump. in touch, especially now. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yes, absolutely. So, Gavin, you came, you saw, mm -hmm. you conquered. <laughs> you, I don't know about that. But. <laughs> uh, can you give us a pre of what you said on Thursday that we need to know about? And yes, you can refer to your PowerPoint. Oh, yes, fantastic. <laughs> well, thank you. You know how I love the slides. Um, well, I just I want to thank you, Jay, and you, Sharon, for, for having me out here on Think oh, Tech. Uh, you know, I do watch it from D.C. from time to time oh, yeah. and really love the production coming out of here. You guys do great work. Uh, and I'm so happy to be here on the show. Um, basically, I, you know, kind of thinking about how to frame this this question of climate and clean energy in the Trump era. Um, I've done a very journalistic thing and resorted to a shorthand trope. Um, and that is that it's kind of, for climate and clean energy, it's the best of times, worst of times, right? Yes. Um, when it comes to, you know, the beginning of 2017, we have this big energy paradox, right? It's, we have a climate denier going in the White House who said he's going to cancel the clean power plant, potentially pull us out of Paris, although Rex Tillerson is saying some other things about that now. Um, but for a planet that's already kind of behind the pace in limiting carbon emissions to kind of limit uh, our temperature increase to two degrees this century, um, the loss of that diplomatic will from the federal government would seem to be catastrophic for the planet, right? For I think the planet, that, yes. Well, I think that's the way a lot of people looked at it the day after the election, and certainly from an environmental standpoint, that was my initial reaction, right? You've changed um, your mind? Well, uh, not exactly, <laughs> but I think that there's, it's not all gloom and doom. There is reason for hope, and I think that's because there are states like Hawaii that are doing really ambitious things, setting ambitious targets, and figuring out how to make a clean energy economy and a clean energy power generation system that can power the rest of the clean energy economy economy. Um, so basically my thesis for everyone here in Hawaii is that you're going to show us how to do it. Um, you know, I don't think climate denial will be the, uh, the policy of the U.S. federal government forever. Um, so if and when the pendulum does swing back the other way... I sure hope it's soon. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Well, I will, you know, <laughs> leave those value judgments up for anyone. But for, I think for from the standpoint of climate action, if and when it does swing back the other way, and we do want to do something federally on climate, um, states like Hawaii are going to show us how to do it, and they're going to dictate whether we can do it cost effectively for consumers. So I know it's a slog here going through and trying to get through, uh, get to the 100% renewable energy mandate, but uh, it's critically important that uh, you, know, you guys do well at it, succeed, and teach us all else, all throughout the nation, how to do it. Um, so, that's, that's a great yeah. message for Hawaii, and that's, that's the Port Parole message of our whole program here. Yeah. And it's Gavin's message, too. I love it. Oh, yeah, I guess so. So I've got a couple of slides to just kind of illustrate um, just kind of the market, uh, the market situation for clean energy and, and decarbonization in, uh, at the beginning of 2017. Go for it. Um, so the first slide here, if we can bring that up. Um, 
It's, it's coming now. soon. Am, am I going, no, there okay. it is. Okay. This is, I say, okay, Hooray. so going back to the Dickens things, best of times, worst of times, are, do we have a tale of two nations when it comes to uh, energy and climate policy? And, and at first blush, you would think, yes, right? So this is the uh, percent change in, in CO2 emissions from 2000 to 2014. Hawaii there? There's Hawaii uh, over, on the, oh, over on the right really side like, of the okay, screen. I yeah, I had to that. split it up because it was a long... Uh, okay, um, nice. It was a long... It's just off graphic. Maine. This is from a Brookings Institution study that came out last <laughs> month. Um, and basically what I wanted to do with this is just show that you know there are a lot of states especially in the northeast the west coast and down and down south that have had some good success in decoupling their economic growth from their carbon emissions you know states like georgia and tennessee which you wouldn't think are big clean energy states because they've switched from coal to natural gas and because they've sourced a lot of power from nuclear they've been able to support you know strong economic growth throughout this period without raising emissions a similar story for the states in the northeast and out west um, so, but when I looked at this at first, I thought, oh, well, now that we're entering the kind of the Trump era, we're going to maybe lose some of that impetus, that momentum. Maybe we will see this, this nation keep pulling apart a little bit more. Um, mm. But the Brookings people that I talked to and other analysts, you know, they said, well, maybe yes, but maybe not. Um, because renewable energy has been making inroads in many of these, you know, orange, some of the more conservative states in the heartland that we see. Uh, and everyone expects that to continue. So if we can go to the next slide, um, I think we can demonstrate why. So this is the, uh, this is a, a slide from the investment firm Lazard, and it's just comparing the, uh, market, the market price for renewable energy and, uh, and all of the conventional generation. So if you see at the bottom there, I have highlighted, that says gas combined cycle. And that's in your kind of run-of-the-mill modern gas generator on the electric system today. It ranges from $48 to $78 a megawatt hour in the average levelized cost in this survey. And the interesting thing about this was that it showed for the first time, if you look at the wind energy, which is at the bottom of the alternative energy um, uh, block up there, the range is actually quite competitive with natural gas, and the range is actually lower. It's from $32 to $62 a megawatt hour. This is on an unsubsidized basis. It's without, it's without federal tax incentives for wind and solar. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the solar PV, the crystalline utility scale, the thin film utility scale, very, very competitive with natural gas in many parts of the nation, and cheaper than coal. Um, so this is the market situation without subsidies today. What is this telling us, this chart? Well, let's, uh, it's telling us that renewables today are at grid parity with fossil fuels. Now, they have problems. They're not dispatchable, right? You can't have wind and solar all around the clock without energy storage, and we can talk about that a little right. later. So if, if, but this is, is without uh, the problem of storage, but if you add the cost of storage in, these numbers will change. These numbers will surely change, but we yeah. see really and a lot of really encouraging developments coming out of Hawaii, actually, with bringing the cost of storage and solar plus storage facilities We're down. determined to do that. You know that. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and it's going to be critically important for a state like Hawaii that wants to take fossil fuels off the system. Um, I think if we can go to the next slide, so we like, can is get storage, a... Yeah. Is, uh, going back to that storage question, is storage commercialized enough that you would get some kind of rate? like that to say how much more you would add on for storage to the utility that's that's a cost. that's a tough question i think it, it's a Utilities and, and developers are still really figuring out. Like some of these, a lot of the projects are one-offs right now. Storage is just maturing into a grid-scale mm -hmm. resource. And I think that that's one of the big uh, stories of 2016 was that um, energy storage did kind of prove that it could be a viable replacement for uh, natural gas. But, but to go on Sharon's on point, that chart you just showed us. Yes. Uh, right now it doesn't include storage, but there will come a time, maybe Absolutely. in the next year or two, when you could rebuild that chart and include the cost of storage and, sure. and see if it still works as against fossil fuel. Sure, and I think it's difficult. There just simply aren't enough solar plus storage facilities on the system today to really model that out, right? Yes, you can't do a, an average thing. But the ones that we do see, the contracts that are being signed, are really quite encouraging. We had, uh, you know, KIUC, the Kauai, um, utility cooperative over on the island of Kauai, in 2015 signed a power purchase agreement with Solar City and Tesla. 100% dispatchable solar. It's a right. big 52 megawatt solar hour battery. and storage solar together. And Same storage. deal. Yeah. So they charge these big batteries through, during the day, and then when the sun goes down and everyone goes home, starts to use electricity. This is what's going to happen. Back. This, this is, is what's that's the happen. idea, it's got, right? It's that combination um, package thing that yeah. uh, KIUC did. We're going to see that on the chart you just described. Well, uh, I, that's what that's the hope at least, and we're going to yeah. see that hopefully continue to come down. Um, the 
the KIUC actually just signed another PPA last week um, with an energy storage company, AES, and it's actually 30% cheaper than the storage the contract that they just signed not even two years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, you know, obviously Hawaii is a special test case. I haven't looked at the contract itself. A lot of these things are proprietary. No, but you are very familiar with Hawaii things. I, yeah, but yeah, it's... You're not fooling around. Well, Kevin's I, not fooling around. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, if... Uh, we uh, you know, try to be as, as you know, and we should see, we don't be. we? Yeah, um, <laughs> but it's uh, you know that was really encouraging and exciting for a lot of people in the system today. That that storage was that solar plus storage was signed for eleven cents a kilowatt hour. And the exciting thing about that is the prevailing electricity rate on the mainland. If you take all the residential rates and average them it's 12 and a half cents a kilowatt hour. So wow. if, I don't know if AES can make that big, that big facility into something that goes, you know, into your garage and on your roof yet, probably not because the economies of scale probably help them uh, keep the, so, the cost down. And you but, realize that Kauai But you know, you can do it again, rate. just 28 yeah, megabytes here, yeah. 28 megabytes but, there. But well, we will see, that's the look hope. Look at how, how much Kauai has, has, has accomplished because their rates are like, 40, getting 40 yeah, this is yeah. remarkable. Exactly, and yeah. they will save a yeah. lot of money Maybe. doing that. Yeah, they're um, showing us all a yeah. few yeah. things or two. Yeah, yeah. 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 Let's, so go, let's, to the let's go to the next slide. Let's go the next slide because it's a little bit more detailed look at. Um, oh, this is a. Uh, is there the one with the map? Um, uh, well, this is a. Uh, well, we've established. Uh, you know, renewables have their uh, grid parity throughout the nation, and uh, you know, there's especially very competitive for wind in the heartland, you know, places like Nebraska, Kansas, you know, where they're windy, windy plain states. And then solar, you can actually see in, in many parts of the Southwest, is actually the cheapest resource on the system. So that would make you feel very good about the U.S. climate situation, right? You would think, well, if the, uh, if we've been switching from natural gas to renewables, that's driven decarbonization for the past 10 years, then we continue doing that. Everyone expects that to continue despite Trump. Well, then what's the problem, right? And this chart kind of shows us what the problem is. It's that those trends alone aren't enough. We're simply not moving fast enough on decarbonization. So what is this saying? What is the federal chart target? Saying? So this is a, so all of these bars show what's called the carbon, the annual decrease in carbon intensity. So it's basically your economic growth, the difference between your economic growth and your carbon emissions growth. Um, so as we can see, the highlighted bar in the middle there is the United States as an average. And annually we've been, you know, taking down the carbon intensity of the economy by about 2.1% a year from 2000 to 2014. The problem is we need to be all the way up where that orange line is up there if we're going to meet the goals for the United States under the Paris Protocol. That's the progress line. That's the, yeah, that's the target that's line, right? And you can see places like North Dakota or D.C. that have had really explosive economic growth. It's not that North Dakota has actually cut their emissions. They've just, just they've their changed. economy has Delta grown factor. so much. Yeah. Yeah, so what is what is that uh, line at? What what, um, uh, what you know? If I could if I could line? read the if I could read the thing, but um, <laughs> I think it's uh. Can you move that graph? I think we need to be right? a little bit. Uh, I don't. I think it's the way I oh. I cropped it, but I think yeah. we need to be up a little. The number itself is kind of an abstraction, but we need to be you know doing two to three times better, faster than yeah. we are now, yeah. than we are yeah. today yeah. Yeah. Uh, on yeah. on a nas nationwide basis, Where's right? Hawaii? Yeah. Where's um, Hawaii? Okay. Well, why don't we go? You want to see your next slide then? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Next slide. Ah. So here's why I'm saying, so that, you know, you look at that and you think, oh, well, it is all gloom and doom. We're, you know, we're not going to see much more action on the federal level, but there's reasons to be optimistic about uh, power sector decarbonization in the future. And this is one of the slides that shows you why. Uh, this slide is from the most recent um, uh, Department of Energy Quadrennial Techno Energy Review. What does it show us? What's it show what it shows us is the expected life for, um, for all of the generation capacity on the system today. So the different bars you can see on the bottom relate, relate to different resources. Coal is the gray on the bottom there. Uh, natural gas is the green. And the point of this chart is showing, you know, taken today, and this report came out last month, um, or this month, you know, how long can we expect every, every plant to stay on the system? The point of this is that you can see the gigantic glut of natural gas uh, capacity that was put on the system about 15 years ago, all those tall green bars there. A lot of analysts I talk to don't expect them to get to that expected life of their natural gas. Um, natural gas plants are cheaper than coal plants, the nuclear plants, so they depreciate faster. Utilities basically get their bang for their buck much faster out of these plants. So if renewables um, and other, you know, dispatchable uh, clean generation or even, you know, more efficient uh, natural gas plants come onto the system, a lot of people are telling me they expect those big, those, you know, big green bars of natural gas, that 150 gigawatts of combined cycle, 70 gigawatts or more of, uh, 
combustion turbines, that they might go offline and be replaced by new capacity in the mid to late 2020s or early 2030s. Mm -hmm. Now, that, the point of that is it opens up a gigantic opportunity for dispatchable renewable resources, not just to tinker around the edge of the system, but to really make inroads and replace carbon-emitting resources with clean technology. So what does this tell us about the, what we should be focusing on? The, yeah, it, what it tells us is that we have a big opportunity around the corner if we can get the price of dispatchable renewables and other clean energy down to where when all of those natural gas plants come off the system, utilities put clean energy in mm -hmm. instead of putting other natural gas in. The, the whole natural gas has been a positive for the climate over the past you know, decade and a half. A lot of utilities have switched from burning, go burning coal in their plants to b burning their natural gas plants more just because the gas price has been so cheap. Um, and fully, that, that kind of accounts for about two-thirds of the decarbonization we've seen. Um, but going forward, it presents a problem. If a utility makes a, an investment in a natural gas plant or a pipeline today, they obviously expect it to be on the system for decades in the future, 20 years or more in the case of a natural gas plant, <coughs> typically speaking. So we need to be, you know, when that natural gas, when the, that glut of natural gas gets ready to retire, if we replace it with clean energy, we'll have a much better chance of hitting our targets under the Paris Accord. If we don't replace it with clean energy, well, we're just going to put more carbon, we're going to just lock ourselves in to more carbon emitting resources on right, the system right. for decades to come. Well, that teaches me two things. The first is that, you know, this is all a matter of change. Transformation yes, is change. Change is a matter of, um, you know, looking forward, having new ideas. Uh, and it's also, you know, retiring old ones. Yeah. And we have to move from old to new. We always have to move from old to new, and that's the only way you can handle a transformation in energy or anything else, and in the mainland or Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's one thing it teaches me. The other thing it teaches me is that Gavin has an incredible ability to give us an enormous bit of information without taking a breath. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm, I know, that was... <laughs> I'm, no, we're going to let him take a breath now. We're going to take a break so Gavin can breathe. Ready? Go! <laughs> Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. I'm the host of Center Stage, which is on Wednesdays at 2 o'clock here on ThinkTech. On Center Stage, I talk with artists about not only what they do and how they do it, but the meat of the conversation for me is why they do it, why we go through this. A lot of us are not making our livings doing this, and a lot of us would do this with our last dying breath if we had that choice. And that's what I love to talk to people about. I hope you enjoy watching it, and I hope you get inspired because there's an artist inside you, too. Join us on Center Stage at 2 o'clock on Wednesdays. Bye. Aloha. My name is Josh Green. I serve as senator from the Big Island on the Kona side, and I'm also an emergency room physician. My program here on ThinkTech is called Healthcare in Hawaii. I'll have guests that should be interesting to you twice a month. We'll talk about issues that range from mental health care to drug addiction to our health care system and any challenges that we face here in Hawaii. We hope you'll join us. Again, thanks for supporting ThinkTech. <laughs> okay, we're back. We're live with uh, Gavin Bade. He's the editor, the editor of Utility Dive. One of the uh, one, Oh, sorry. The one editor, of the, the editors. We'll talk more about that. <laughs> the only editor. The important editor. Okay, okay we're whatever. talking about climate <laughs> action in the age of Trump and Hawaii's role in that action. And uh, this is in the clean energy revolution. But before we go into exactly the energy revolution and Hawaii's role, and I want to ask you some more about Utility Dive. Okay. What is it? How big is it? Who's yeah. involved? Why? So Utility Dive is an electric utility trade publication. Uh, we're based in Washington, D.C., and we focus on uh, the entire U.S. nation uh, in the power sector here. Um, some other international coverage, but mostly the U.S. power sector. Um, and I guess our, our mission is just to provide policymakers and industry officials with actionable information so that they can deliver you know, a cleaner power system at lower cost. Do they consumers. listen to you? I hope so. I mean, it seems like we've been, uh, over the past two years since I've been here, it seems like we've caught on a little bit. We've been growing. Um, and I think, you Who know, do you daily, appeal to? Um, we appeal to people, I mean, renewable energy executives, so people who are putting wind and solar on the system. Our target audience is, includes them, utility executives, so people who work at HECO or KIUC. Government? Um, on the mainland. Yeah, absolutely. Um, people who work at the PUC, people who work uh, in the governor's energy office. You know, any policymaker or industry official, anyone who basically has a vested interest and a say in the energy transformation, we want them to read Utility Dive. Where um, do you get your data from? Who makes the analysis at uh, Utility Dive? Um, to the five of us who work there, I have, it's, it's me and my co-editor, Christy, are the, the two editors in the office, overseen by senior editor Davide. Um, and then we have two full-time writers, 
who are fantastic, Robert Walton and Herman Trabish, um, and then a part-time writer who's equally as fantastic, Peter Maloney. Um, and you know, shout out to all of them. Shout out to <laughs> all of them. Yeah, yeah, all right. Thank yeah. You, Steph. Um, and that, uh, basically, it all comes from us. We do some semi-aggregation stuff, so we'll take headlines from throughout the nation, kind of distill them, and then add our insight. Um, but just kind of trying to talk to all of the industry experts out in the field. You know, I try to talk to consultants and lobbyists and analysts and you know people who work in policy offices. And then the You're industry. You're on the phone themselves. a lot. Yeah, yeah, and ma doing meetings and you know trying to just kind of piece through this you know the energy transformation. So how can I get the benefit of utility time? Well, we have a free daily newsletter uh, that goes out to more than thirty thousand utility executives and policymakers throughout the nation. You can sign up at utilitydive.com. All of our content is hundred percent free. You won't pay for anything on Utility Dive our reports, our newsletters, or anything. So there's a daily newsletter, and then there's three weeklies, one on energy storage, one on efficiency and demand-side management, mm. and Ooh, one right on down the solar. Channel. Yeah, yeah, one yeah, on solar. Yeah. So, you know, we're you know always looking to expand, but those are our options today. Kesh and say the app. What is the app? Ah, yes, we have the app as well. Uh, you know, get it on your phone. It's free, and you can just have basically all of the utility headlines right in your hand every day. Um, you know, we've got the app, we've got the mobile web, and we'll shoot every, you know, the email to your inbox every day. So, um, you know, I, I think it... <laughs> I want that. If you want to be inundated, we can do that. <laughs> oh, happy. Happy to be inundated. So one more question before we go back to the substance here, and that is dive? What is dive? Dive, okay. Are you I'm diving glad, into I'm utility? I'd like to, to know that. So utility dive is one of 12 publications that's a part of a fantastic parent company called Industry Dive. Um, and these three guys who founded it just kind of saw that there was a demand for, you know, really succinct to the point analysis across a bunch of different industries. So they kind of, you know, started off uh, a few years ago. It's actually, we're just moving out of the startup phase. Um, you know, started working in a Korean grocery store and they put these newsletters together and we've since graduated. Well, it all makes total sense, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, so it's, uh, it's utility, so it's Industry Dive. So we are Utility Dive, but then there's... It means diving, diving in. Diving in, right? Diving yeah, you dive in. Get right in, the in there. But then we have retail dive, healthcare dive, biopharma, okay, okay. food, wonderful. everything you can imagine. What a great so. brand. I think so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it can be, the, the name, I mean, I will admit, was a little, uh, it threw me for a loop when but, I first but it, it's memorable. And, yeah, I guess yeah, so, yeah. yeah. People keep on saying, it's a drive. It's the drive. drive. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, but after you get past yeah. that. <laughs> So let's let's dive into okay. what's going on in Hawaii. Connect yeah. it up for us, Gavin. Yeah, so I guess before the break we just got done saying that just around the corner there's going to be there depending on what happens in generation markets, there are all these caveats, but a lot of analysts think that there's going to be a big opportunity to replace a big amount of coal and natural gas on the system in the near future. Um, and whether that gets replaced with, you know, renewables and storage, with advanced nuclear, with advanced biomass, uh, with something, you know, with maybe natural gas, with carbon capture, that's all going to depend on, you know, how states like Hawaii and other ambitious jurisdictions, uh, you know, drive technological change, uh, drive the adoption of renewables and other clean energy, and create market mechanisms that allow them to really get a foothold. Well, um, in part, that that uh, depends on what you say about us, doesn't it? Well, I don't, I don't so know we're about happy that. to see you here. Think, we you want know. you to publish what we're doing everywhere, yeah? I, I would say that you guys are pushing the narrative and that we're just reporting on okay, it. Right? Okay, okay, okay. Um, you know, true <laughs> journalism, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, in any case, I think that there are a lot of really encouraging things happening in Hawaii. We touched on uh, the two KIUC projects that you know are going slated to be dispatchable solar plus storage. So you know, storing up all of the solar energy that you generate during the day in big batteries. So you're looking for leadership points. Yes, you're looking for things at the frontier that we may have. Absolutely. And then you're going to sort of publish that. You are publishing that out, yes, yes. so everybody can see. And that creates the leadership process you're talking about. Absolutely, and that's a, a big. I think that's a big. You know, motivation behind what we do every day is taking you know, st you know, local or state level stories of clean energy success, um, you know, or, or difficulties to be perfectly sure, frank, sure. and you know, trying to, trying to trans, you know, just broadcast them across the nation. So you know, people who l work in Ohio at AEP or you know, up in the Northeast at National Grid, they can learn from what you guys are doing here in Hawaii. So make and a prediction versa. for me, Gavin. Okay. How is Hawaii going to do? How is Hawaii going to right. do? From all that you know. In, in meeting the 100% renewable energy mandate? Whatever. <laughs> Whatever we do, what do you think? Okay, we're you're, do? I'm wading into, you know, <laughs> quite uh, This is as deep, I had to say, asking they you to dive into deep, yeah. water, deep water, water. Okay, deep water. Knowing what you know. I don't want to speak out of turn here, but I think, you know, what we've, based on what we've seen is that, you know, 
being the leader in, this, in the clean energy, being one of the leaders in the clean energy revolution is never easy. And it's always going to be fits and starts. So, you know, going through a couple iterations of the Hawaii electric power supply plan is probably how, you know, things have to go at first so that regulators and the utility can come up with a good plan to get going. It's going to be fits and starts, but I think you're going to do it because you're going to do it hook or by crook. There's a legislative mandate and there's political, there's political will behind it, you know? I don't think I, you know, unless things go terribly, terribly wrong, I don't see the Hawaii state legislature legislature bringing back the 100% renewable energy mandate, uh, at least not anytime soon. I mean, you never know. You, can, you well, never know what happens in today's the, politics. PSIP is talking about, you know, 2040, not 2045. So indeed. So a certain yeah. amount of interest in moving that deadline closer. Yeah, indeed. I, you know, I think the, the point is there's political will behind it, um, and people are really pushing the utilities to do that. So I think that, they, that we will. Um, the, the question is just kind of, you know, the... I like that Hawaii, you know, California, other states have kind of defined the what, but now we have to work on the how, right? So I think the, the first thing that it seems that we need to do is, you know, the, we're talking to utility people is that we, the, the modernized grid is a necessity, right? Getting the grid ready for two-way power flows so more people can hook up rooftop solar, can hook up batteries, um, and so that the utility can solve problems on the distribution system with distributed resources instead of building a new power line or, or you know, upgrading a power plant or something like that. Um, so up Upgrading the grid is going to be really critical. I think that's the first thing that, you know, what the utility people tell me is that's the first thing that probably has to happen. After you do that, then it's just a, an issue of, okay, well, which technologies do we choose? You know, do we go back to, do you guys go back to the LNG route to help integrate the renewables? You know, do you focus on biomass? I've heard talk even of uh, advanced nuclear and modular reactors, although I know there's constitutional issues there. Maybe not I going mean, to happen. State, there are politi political sure. uh, considerations on that. that exactly. Really, Perhaps it, speaking out of turn Impossible here. obstacles. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> In any case, I think it's, you know, it's going to be really tough for, you know, you, there's going to a lot of work ahead between the utilities and the regulators uh, to to kind of plot out what's going to be the most cost-effective uh, well, transition process. What I get process, from you is that things are basically in place. It's a, it's a maturation process. I mean, Hawaii has been involved in this actively politically since 2008, right? If mm -hmm. not before, the, the Clean mm -hmm. Energy Initiative here. And, uh, you, know, we, you know, we have had our fits and starts, and we may have fits and starts going forward. Mm -hmm. So the question is, are we, are we past fits and starts? Probably not. Um, but we are at a point where we can see the outlines of the available options right now. We can build a pathway, recognizing yeah. there will be changes in technology and all that, and there will be political issues, they always are. Mm -hmm. um, but at least we can see the outlines and we make a plan. And maybe, yeah. Yeah. my question to you, maybe we are at a level of maturity that allows us to go forward with a minimum of disruption, a minimum of back and fill, if you will, yeah. um, so that the world can watch us, really watch us, and really learn. Are we there, do you think? Uh, I've certainly been encouraged, you know, to see people from the utility, the solar industry, policymakers, you know, in our discussions this week, have, the lines of communication seem open, and in the conversations that we have, they seem honest and frank, and that's, you know, that's the, that's the first thing you need if you're going to make any progress on these contentious issues of rooftop solar compensation, of, you know, which resources do you solar where do you source them? How do you cite them? I know is a big issue. Um, so, you know, kind of having a having a constructive dialogue between the commission and and all of the stakeholders is the first step, and I've been encouraged to see that. Um, I think it's. It's always difficult when you, you know, after it's, there's been a lot of stuff going on at the Public Utilities Commission, basically, right? There's the next era merger. There's the PSIP. You know, how about the, impatience? Mm. Is there room for impatience in this? I think everyone's I'm impatient. impatient. Everyone's impatient. I think Sharon's Because the planetary too. situation should make us we impatient. Have to, we have to go there now. We want it done yeah. right, though. But we, we yeah, exactly. But you want it done right. And, and there, are some real, there are some real technical and, and market issues that need to be solved before we can actually can get there. Will you um, come back and talk to us again about this? Yeah, absolutely. She wants to like ask you some cross-examination now <laughs> before she summarizes what you've said. Go for it, Sharon. Oh, no, I think, I think Gavin has brought a, a good... Um, discussion to us about what's happening in other states, but also, you know, that we can be a model. Uh, and part of what we're talking about is the trends going forward and, mm -hmm. and the market being such that we can actually keep moving forward. I think we're a little in disarray thinking, gee, the Trump world is going to trump us all and we're going to go back to what we were before. And, and I know what it, long ago when the Bush administration started this, we had this push toward renewables, and then the, the oil prices went down, and we left it. And mm -hmm. so I think Senator, the late Senator Inouye said, look, we can't afford to blink. 
and, mm-hmm. and that's what this is all about, is mm-hmm. how do we keep going forward? And I think Gavin, looking at what's going forward and what's swirling around us, kind of keeping our eye on, on, on the prize and then, mm-hmm. you know, really moving in that direction. Mm-hmm. So my question to Gavin is, um, how, how can we do that? I mean, you mentioned, you know, some of the areas where we should really be focusing on, but what can states do? Uh, and we talked about this a little bit in terms of the public and, the, and how we can get the public engaged and what mm. we should do. Good news. So, you got the question? What, so you have you one, minute to, one minute to answer that question. Public engagement, no mm-hmm. pressure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I think the public. So the first thing is that public engagement in energy is higher in Hawaii than anywhere else because there's a big pocketbook issue here. Um, but I think it's you know. It's, it's, it shows like this. It's uh, it's the the utility and the stakeholders coming together to present a united option and just being you know kind of frank with the stakeholders and with the press about what's going on. Um, I think you know open lines of communication and transparency is the biggest thing because people are watching what's happening in Hawaii. I think that you know elected officials, uh, especially you know the federal elected officials who go to Washington, um, but also people on the state level. I think a big thing that's going to be important during you know state and federal level during the Trump administration is building political power for clean energy, you know, getting the solar people and the wind people together with the nuclear people, with the people who support biomass, and even, you know, natural, the natural gas and industry. And that can and, and must and will and should happen in the States yes. and in Hawaii. You have to, You've yeah. got it from, yeah. from Gavin Bade, uh, the, one of the many editors, one of the five <laughs> editors, <laughs> at Utility Dive in Washington, D.C., talking with us today about climate action in the age of Trump. <laughs> and Hawaii's role in the clean energy revolution. And he will continue to. And he will continue to. Thank yes. you, Gavin. I'll come back. Aloha. 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 Aloha